Today's flip through is on Paul Adrian Dirac, and the book title is The Strangest Man, The Hidden Life of Paul Dirac, Mystic of the Atom, and that's by Graham Farmello. This book is a history book more than anything, and if you like quantum mechanics, you like the history of science, if you like learning about some of the greatest minds of all time, you'll probably like this book. It's not a, a page turner. Um, it's hard to rate because while it's um, slow, mundane, uh, I look forward to reading it each and every day. The book, as I start to flip through, starts in chronological order. And this date is 1914, and it talks about some of the problems that Paul Dirac has growing up, as really anyone might have problems growing up with a family and class. And it's incontrovertible that he is a classic genius. What does that mean? Well, if you end up having uh, social anxiety, if you have problems socializing, if you are obsessed with one and only one thing, and often it's mathematics, or having trouble in school, but somehow you're smarter than everyone else in the school, you might be that, quote, classic genius. Newton was one of these geniuses that we really have a hard time understanding because Newton was hundreds of years ago. Even Einstein, who was around with Dirac, uh, did not live quite as long as Dirac. So Dirac lives into uh, his 80s and ends up at Florida State and is still making public appearances in his old age. And so we have a better feel for Dirac. But he is, in many ways, uh, an equal to Newton, to Einstein, to Bohr. If you think of the neutrino, well, he doesn't discover the neutrino. He is intimately uh, involved with those discoveries, along with the antimatter. If you think of string theory, you should be thinking of Paul Dirac, neutrons and neutrinos, and uh, so many other things. So if, if we flip through here, uh, you'll see that his upbringing influences his life just like everyone else. And... He has skills that are mainly theoretical, but he is going to be one of these rare scientists that's also an incredible mathematician and an engineer. So he is um, kind of odd in, in that manner. Often we think that you're either a theoretician or an experimentalist or a mathematician, uh, or, you know, but we don't normally think of scientists as having all three, and Dirac really does. And as I start to flip through here, you'll see all the classic characters in the history of science, especially with quantum mechanics. You can't have a history of science book without Rutherford, and Rutherford is going to influence Bohr, and of course Bohr is going to be the father figure to everyone. And just Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Summerfield, the Von Lawys, just every scientist and their personal interactions and their disagreements. Heisenberg itself is such a, a controversial figure and how he relates with Dirac and what the other scientists think of one another, not only in a personal level, but their discoveries and their, their, uh, they're going to have deep disagreements philosophically and mathematically and scientifically about all of these things. And they have competing ideas of what the electron is. Can positrons be a real thing? And what are the famous experiments that would lead us to that? And through all of this, it humanizes Dirac. Now, Dirac is not your classic um, scientist that you would think about. He really is a strange human being. In fact, the other scientists came up with a new unit called the Dirac. And the Dirac is one word per minute. And that's about all you're going to end up getting out of Dirac. And here's a guy who's, even today, we're still talking about monopoles and things that we're still fighting for. And Dirac is responsible for many of these ideas, and yet you can't get him to speak about it. He'll, he'll say yes or no if you ask him, you know, what was your research like on monopoles? After a minute of, of sitting and staring blankly, thinking, he would say, interesting. And that's all you get, and then he would walk away. And, but remember, Dirac is uh, not a superhero. 
we, we like to think of these scientists as, as being so much different than us. And, and in many ways they are, but they're not, they're not beyond human. I mean, Dirac falls in love. He eventually drives a car. He ends up having children and uh, he wears clothes just like everyone else. I mean, the, the same clothes every day, but they're, they're human beings. And what makes them different is their effort, the time, and their dedication to their craft, which happens to be a particular thing about nature. Does that mean the rest of us could be a, a Paul Dirac or an Albert Einstein or Newton? It's doubtful that any of us would have that type of, of mind that would allow us to dedicate so much time and effort to one thing. But it, it, it's not inconceivable that we could also make great contributions. But most of us are not willing to put the time and effort in. So this idea that they're something so different than us is difficult. I, I, I think genius is kind of like a mythological you know, term. Um, what we should say is they spent the most time, most effort, and thought the deepest and worked the hardest to figure these things out, and that's why we respect them. But if you were to try to line up the greatest scientists, it, it, most of us know about the Solvay Conference, 1927. You have all the greats of quantum mechanics that are talking about electrons and energy and photons. And you'll have Albert Einstein. Well, Paul Dirac is standing right behind Einstein, almost saying, it's my turn next. And Einstein thought so highly of uh, Dirac that he nominated him for the Nobel Prize. And in fact, he even says that uh, Dirac is probably the greatest scientist in his, in his lifetime. And uh, so that's high praise. When, when Einstein is, is basically saying that you're the best, that says something. Now, what's interesting, later on in the chapters, let me get my glasses on, uh, we eventually get to the interactions during the war, and we bring in a lot of other interesting figures and what they were doing, Schrodinger and uh, Richard Feynman comes into the picture. And Feynman is going to start to overthrow some of the ideas of Dirac. And while Feynman, and for those of you that don't know, that's Richard Feynman, very popular, also thought of as a genius. Feynman wants n nothing more than to interact with Dirac, but it's nearly impossible to get him in conversation. But there's another famous picture, and this is what the author does so well. He's making this come alive, the interactions between each of these scientists. And when there's another picture taken, you can see, just like Dirac standing behind Einstein, Richard Feynman now stands behind Dirac in kind of a, a similar passing of the guard. And uh, so the author does a fantastic job of, of bringing each of these scientists to life. While it's mainly about Dirac, you learn about so many other things and um, how contentious it was. And while many of these scientists are, are thought to be like Newton and, and is often thought of um, post, uh, posthumously as being uh, autistic, some would say that Paul Dirac had autism. It would be unfair to try to, uh, to, to say that for sure, but he's clearly on the spectrum here. And, and the author provides enough information and, and literally talks about this for you to get a, a sense of that and you can make your own decision. In the end, it doesn't matter if we label someone something, look at their work. But as he gets older, Dirac's ideas start to fall out of fashion. The newer generation uh, for quantum mechanics comes in and you start to have some of these battles and Dirac starts to fade away a bit. And in many ways, and there's a few pictures here that, you know, give a little sense of, of, of the man. Look, he lives in a normal house. He eventually goes to Princeton and goes to other countries and lives there for a while, but ends up at Florida State. Why does he end up at Florida State? And this reminded me a lot of, of Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling, another great Nobel Prize winner, actually won two. Um, he is going to end up falling for some, first of all, he falls out of fashion and he starts, as he gets older, you get sick and an illness happens in your family. Linus Pauling gets a little bizarre and starts believing holistic 
ideas and vitamin C and is no longer really respected. Well, Paul Dirac also falls into this category. He's going to get sick and he's going to talk to doctors and he's a human being and he might like one doctor more than the other and fall for some inefficient practices. But regardless, uh, as Paul Dirac, as so many of the other older scientists fall out of fashion, other scientists, it's just a matter of respect. You still go to their lectures. You disagree vehemently now with some of their claims, but because they're one of the greats, you sit there respectfully and and you nod. Um, it's it's a little bit sad, but the author does a pretty good job of of bringing out the humanity in each of these scientists. So while the book is primarily about Dirac, you learn so much about what it's like to be a scientist and a great scientist. And uh, even if you're not a great scientist, why are you never actually heard of? So, um, and it goes on and on. Um, but even today, Paul Dirac should be thought of as one of the great scientists that have uh, probably contributed more to the mathematics and the science of quantum mechanics and modern physics. So I highly recommend this book if you are a lover of the history of science. It is Again, it's, it's so hard to review because I don't even know why I enjoyed this book as much as I did. But I would look forward to coming home and reading, you know, five mundane pages about his interactions with his wife or uh, other scientists writing letters back to one another. Um, it is a long book. I, again, I, I found it um, a calming influence in my life and uh, a really humanizing way to understand uh, science. So um, it might be for you. All right. Well, that's my flip through for today.